Judge LaVange, you may now restart again. Thank you. Bien, on va faire un nouvel essai. Concluant. Judge LaVange, let us try once again. Is it coming through now? Mr. Nunchair. On several occasions in the statements you have made, you referred to a town called Pre Noko. You talked about the liberation of Pre Noko. Can you tell us, please, if Using that name, you are now you are referring to the city that is now called Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon. Response: Do you know, Your Honor, previously it was called Pre No Go, which was part of the Cambodian territory. Later on, in the Vietnamese name, it was called Saigon and subsequently it was called Ho Chi Minh. Alors, Monsieur Nunchia. Mr. Nunchia, if you refer to this city as Pre no Ko, rather than Ho Chi Minh City, is this pure chance or is it the reflection of some kind of intention? Response, I did not have any intention. That was what I called. I, I, I used both uh, Pre No Go or Ho Chi Minh. And I actually used it according to the error it was used. Previously it was called Pre No Go, later on Saigon, and now it is known as Ho Chi Minh City. I did not have any hidden agenda in that because the three names refer to the same location of the city. At the start of this questioning session, Mr. Nunjir, you said that you had thought of joining the resistance because in your youth, you were acquainted with the French colonial regime and you saw how the French mistreated Cambodians by arresting them, beating them and throwing them into jail. You also said that you had seen how the rich behaved vis-à-vis -vis the weaker in society treating them as slaves and beating them. You also said that it was after you had seen these injustices as a young man, man you felt sympathy and compassion for the people who were so badly treated and you felt a wish to fight oppression. Can you just confirm to us that that is indeed what you did say? Thank you. Response. Let me clarify. At that time I felt the sympathy, but I did not have the idea of joining the struggle in order to eliminate those people. I was still very young at the time. I was about 13 or 14 years old. However, I did have the feeling of sympathy and pitiness for those persons who were mistreated. Only at a later stage, when I went to study in Thailand, I read the magazines of the Communist Party of Thailand about the classes and the oppressions. Then I became better aware of the situation. 
So I did not join the struggle when I was young. Only later on, when I know more about the situation and I analyze the situation, then I did not think of my own interest. I think of the people's interest. Thank you. Mr. Nunchia, when you use the word compassion, should one understand that it also has a religious connotation for you? Does it refer in some way to the Buddhist religion? Okay. Response, uh, that is correct. It is also related to the Buddhist religion, which states that do not use the authority. We need to feel compassion for the people. And I studied that well. I hate the compassion for the people as an individual, not from the point of view of a revolutionist, because I did not yet join the revolution at the time. Mr. Nunchia, you also said Cambodians are Buddhist even if they have joined the Communist Party, they kept a respect for Buddhism and its principles. Can you tell me what principles you were referring to? Would those include the principle of rejecting all kinds of violence, or a principle consisting in respect for human life? Response. My personal view is that the revolution is based on the notions of materialism as in Buddhism. The idea based on materialism is also used. So in the revolution, the notion of dialectical materialism is similar to that in the Buddhist religion. That is, people are educated to feel compassion for one another to help one another. However, in revolution, in case of necessity, when we are invited, then we shall resist. If we are confronted with armed, then we shall respond accordingly. Even in religion, I also notice this approach. For example, in the uh, conflict of the uh, war on the land and the water, they also used arms, though I could not uh, recollect well. So in certain instances, they are the same, but in other occasions, the Buddhist religion is more on the notion of patience. But for the revolution, we restrain from exercising the, the power of the authority uh, to be womanizers or heavy drinkers or relying much on money. In Buddhism, the notion is quite similar, that is, try to restrain from exercising power, womanizing or heavy drinking or uh, gambling. So the two approaches could coexist.
based on my personal view. So according to you, Mr. Nunchia, a revolutionary in the Communist Party of Kampuchea can take on board the principles of Buddhism and can that person have the same feelings of compassion vis-a-vis -vis all mistreated victims all of those who are victims of arbitrary arrest or detention treatment that leads to the state of slavery and victims that undergo forms of violence that are unjust. Response. It is not uh, identical in every aspect. It is my view that the revolution means to use the labor that is physical labor as well as the mental labor to build the country to make it progressive the religion on the other hand relies on compassion and sympathy as i stated earlier If there is no use of labor in the revolution in order to build the country and the forces, it would not get the result. And also, similarly, in the Buddhism, there is also a practice to a certain extent. For example, mediation is also a form of self-rebuilding so that our mind is cleaned and pure. On the revolution, we have to get rid of self-ego. In a simple term, it means self-ego so there is always a self-ego and if there is a self-ego then it means there would be individualism and if there is individualism it means there would be privatism and if there is privatism there would rise the conflicts therefore on the Buddhism, they try to get rid of selfishness. So similar approach is used. However, in other instances, they are not uh, similar. Where they are the same, then they can be used exchangeably. And for those aspects we are, which are not the same, then we, we put it aside. So, the theories, both in the revolution and in Buddhism, are sometimes the same and sometimes different. For the daily living in Buddhism, we relied on our intelligence, on our meditation, and on the revolution, we try to work hard and we try to focus on our work that is also a form of meditation and when we use our intelligence to resolve the problems we are in a similar approach this is my personal understanding Hello. 
Final question on this subject. On the question of respect, the principle of respect for life. With this principle, is the approach the same one in uh, religion and uh, the communist revolution? A response. Communism only eliminates those people who destroy the country, who could not be educated. I give you an example. The bad people would be reminded, criticized, self criticized once, twice, thrice, and then they would have to make their text on a revolutionary life view. And if they can be reformed, to build a country, that would be fine. But if they cannot be reformed, refashioned, then they would be sacked from the party. The party had no authority to smash anyone, but the party has the authority to demote or to sack party members, and they would be sent to the base authority to make decisions or to the court to decide. As I repeatedly say, the Communist Party of Cambodia is not 100% pure. Because our party is not established in heaven, it was formed in a corrupted society. Therefore, the establishment of a party in such a situation cannot be that 100% pure. Some people can be re-educated while others could not. So for those who could be re-educated, they became good people. And those who could not would be sacked and removed from the party and sent to the local authority to engage in labor. That is all, Your Honor. And the allegation that people were killed or genocide was committed it's not real. There are only two types of war. That is the war of aggression and the war to defend the country. And who conducted the war of aggression? And who conducted the war of defending the country? Foreigners at that time were the Vietnamese and the Americans who conducted the war of aggression against Cambodia. And it was the Cambodian people who, who engage in the war to defend their country, their nation. But, of course, in each war, there, are, there would be various other aspects. There would be propaganda war, for example, sabotage, and various other forms of uh, subcategories of war with the purpose to intimidate the opponent or to weaken the ability of the opponent. Those who engage in the war made the propaganda that even just a nut and a bolt could be spotted from the plane above. That is a type of a psychological war. And if three or four people were hiding under a tree, the heat from the body could be spotted by the reconnaissance plane by America from above. This is a type of war too, it's a psychological war. And when we talk about the war of genocide or the mass killing, of course it's just a type of war, but there are only two main categories of war. That is a war of aggression and a war of defending someone's country. 
Then we need to find out who actually participated in, in each category of this war. Then you would find the real cause of war. So this cause or not waste its time. It's easier to find the reasons of those who engage in these types, two types of war. Are they all Cambodians? Cambodia is a small country with a limited number of population, with limited resources, and Cambodian people are poor. America dropped more than 220 days of bombs, destroying every aspect of Cambodian society. The Vietnamese invaded Cambodia. 500,000 of them. Mr. Nunchia, I must interrupt you. I think it would be very important to answer the question that was asked and answer only to the question that was asked. We will return to some of the matters that you have raised, but I'd wish for you to address the questions that were asked. Now, the question that was just previously put to you, Mr. Nunchia, uh, would you please allow me to finish? Now, the question that was put to you, sir, and you raised yourself, the idea that there was an intention to eliminate bad elements, therefore, was the war served, did the war serve to eradicate those bad elements? When was the political line of eliminating bad elements? elements decided upon? Or when did you become convinced that such a political line were to be implemented? Did the idea originate during your stay in Thailand, during your interactions with the Communist Party of Thailand, or did the idea develop slowly over time, and I would ask for you to answer only that question. Response. The revolution is to build the forces, not to smash the forces. Except in the circumstances where those people, after re-education and rebuilding on several occasions, could not be re-educated or transformed, and those were the vicious people, cruel people who could not be re-educated. For example, when it comes to spying or calling the B-52 bomber to bombard the villages and kill many villagers. For example, in the west part of Kampung Cham, people were holding a ceremony. Then a Khmer spy, who was a network of those groups in America, called upon the bomber and bombs were dropped and half a village were, was destroyed and many villagers were killed. Is that the right approach? You can consider it, Your Honor. Yeah. Very well. On vous, tous les According to you, all of the bad elements who were eliminated during the revolution were spies or were people who simply could not be re-educated? Just as the, the case. But the re-education was not conducted only once. There were many times of re-education. Those people would be re-educated again and again because the revolution needs to keep human resources as a big capital. We need to keep human resources in order to defend the country. It was much better than keeping
killing those people. Unless, like what I have said, there was exceptional case. Alors, je répète une dernière... I'll repeat my question one last time. When did that political line become implemented? When did you decide that you would put into effect such a political line? Was it when you joined the Communist Party of Thailand? Was it when you returned to Cambodia? Did it happen later on? Did it happen before or after the fall of Phnom Penh? Response. I did not do anything when I was a member of the Communist Party of Thailand because I was not a cadre. I was not in the struggle yet. That issue happened when the war in Vietnam became widespread. When Vietnam began their armed struggle in 1960. It was also the time that the Americans began to drop their bombs in Cambodian soil in 1967. So the damage and the anger of the people pushed the birth of this nationalist spirit. How could we remain silenced when our enemy attacked us, when tons of bombs were dropped from above? And when the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia in on the 7th of January 1979 when people were evacuated from Prevain to Nhat Lương Vietnamese tanks ran over Cambodians Lots of Cambodians. The plane bombardment was one thing. But for the Vietnamese, they even came into the forest to continue killing those people who struggled. It was said to Tamok. That dead bodies, swollen dead bodies of women were seen. And the cause was that the Vietnamese troops went into the forest, deep into the forest, and continued to kill those people. Americans only bombed from above. They did not went into that far. Mr. Nunchia, this morning you explained to us that for a time the Communist Party of Kampuchea had not reached the stage of armed conflict, but that it was at a stage of political conflicts. Can you please explain to us the difference between political conflict and revolutionary armed conflict. And I would like to know if in political struggle or political conflict, whether or not any form of violence is used. Response. As I remember, I did not deny that there was armed struggle. The overall picture of struggle in Cambodia 
was the political, economic, cultural, and social struggle. And if necessary, there had to be a combination between armed struggles and political struggle, with the political struggle as the basic principle. The armed struggle was implemented only to defend the base forces. So I do not deny that there was an armed struggle, but armed struggle was not the basic principle that we adopted. It was the political struggle that we choose as our principle. We did analysis among the army. We devised plan in order to decide who would be part of the army. And at that time, I thought, what we need to do next after we won over this war? What if there were people who would steal things or belongings from the people who would rape the villages? What would we do in order to address this issue? So armed struggle was very important, but we could not abandon the political struggle. The political struggle was even more important than the armed struggle because the, that served the people and the people were more satisfied for the political struggles than that of the armed confl conflict or struggle. Monsieur Nunchia. Mr. Nunchia, what is the relationship that you draw between the political struggle and the lifespan of a revolutionary movement within a society that has institutions, that has elections, when you refer to political struggle are you referring to a struggle within state institutions within a democracy or is this or are you referring to something entirely different response as i listened to your question i could not grasp all of it but as i said This political struggle was the basis for the armed struggle. The armed struggle was only supplementary. Because the political struggle was to make the people aware of nationalism. But if they are not aware of nationalism, so they would be considered, they would be like robbers because they got the weapons. I would like to raise an example. Sankatang movement was considered as a nationalist movement. But it was dependent on foreigners. How could we consider that as a nationalist movement? When there was struggle, there was difficulties, they went abroad. When the situation became better, they came back. For that reason, the political struggle was the, the big struggle. 
and political struggle included many pictures that include demonstrations, riots, protests. This may also include the associations of collective work of helping hands among farmers. This was the political struggle. And they kept building into bigger struggle from lower patients to upper patients. So I reiterate the political struggle was the basis, was the fundament for armed struggle. Armed struggle was was only the actions. The political struggle was conducted in terms of the mind of the people. It was very important. If we, lo if we lose in a battle, it is usual for war. But if we lose spiritually, it was that the problem. <laughs> Mr. Nunchia, over the course of your political vol involvement in the Communist Party, were you aware, or you talked about the parliamentary notions in the development of socialism, and in 1956, following the death of Stalin, it was said that an armed insurrection, civil war was not necessary, but that socialism could be achieved through using the parliamentary path, using institutions, through elections. Is this something that you heard about? Was this something that you had considered? Response, I never heard of that. I only understand the national and democratic revolutions. And in Cambodia, we conducted it. We did not yet achieve the national and democratic revolutions. So how could we move on to the social revolution? How could we move on to communism? How many countries in this world excused communism? None. Cambodia at that time only achieved part of the national and democratic revolutions and there were more to do in order to achieve that goal. So we did not yet move on to socialism. Monsieur. Mr. Nunchia, what was the link between the Khmer Workers' Party and, and the Prai Shekshan political group. I hope that I have pronounced the name correctly. Can you please tell us whether or not there, was any, there were any links between the underground political movement to which you were a member and the Prai Shekshan political group, which was an open group. Response. 
they were the same issue. The Brachetian group was part of the People's Revolutionary Party, in which there were some members conducted their activities openly. That included the publish the publication of newspapers and books as to be candidates for elections. These group of people were not connected to the secret party which was to build the human resources. The Brachetian group was a group but not a party. And as I remember, there were only a small number of people who were members of that group. That included Nguyen Sir Kao Mia, Pan, who was a manager of the newspaper and who was shot dead. These people did different activities from those conducted by the secret party. The secret party was the leader. This is my answer to your question, Your Honor. It's good. Were those activities different or complementary to or from one another? Response. Those were different activities. One, there was an open communication between the people group with the government. And as for the party, the activities were secret. Most of them were communication with the poor patients and farmers. The Prichichun group was more of the front. They contacted, they made communication, conducted communication with the government. They published newspapers and books. They were like the nationalist movements. But for this Prachechun group, they had secret communication with the government while the party while the secret party did not have any communication with the government that is my answer your honor aside from the prachachon group there was also a group of what we can refer to as progressive intellectuals, including Hu Yun, Hu Nim, as well as Mr. Kyu Sompan. Can you please tell us if there were any links between the clandestine communist movement of Kampuchea and that particular group of progressive intellectuals? Response, Your Honor. As I remember, Popot called me one time that I had not have to, did not have to contact these people. because I was not knowledgeable about the international relations. So what I had to do was to concentrate on education aspects. 
that is to build the country, uh, to build the party. This is what Pol Pot told me. I thought to myself, I was happy. I was not a progressive intellectual, while others were people who came from France and other countries. And this is what Pol Pot told me. Because I do not speak the intellectual language. Donc, je now, I understand that Pol Pot told you that you individually were not to have any contact with those intellectuals. However, my question is as follows. To your knowledge, did the underground communist movement have any links with that group of progressive intellectuals, be it through Pol Pot or anyone else? Yum. Response, no, there was not. But for those intellectuals coming from France, for example, may have connection. That included Pol Pot, Ingsari, and others who came from France. But for me, I did not come from France. I am here in Cambodia, and I only communicated with the patients. I dared not communicate with intellectuals. Can you please tell us when you met your two fellow co-accused for the very first time? When did you meet Mr. Yang Sari for the very first time? And when did you meet Mr. Kyo Sampan for the very first time? A response. As I remember, it was when, it was after the liberation. I rarely met with Kyozam Pan. I never met Kyozam Pan. Only occasionally that we met, but we never talked. And Mr. Yang. And Mr. Yang Sari, when did you meet him? He was I met with Mr. Yang Sari because we were in the Central Committee together. Rather, the Standing Committee, interpreter correct. Was it during the 1950s, during the 1960s? When was the precise moment that you met them? It was after the Geneva Accord. It was when I met I believe that it is perhaps time to take a break. Mr. President, I defer to you. The President, thank you, Judge Lavange, and thank you, Mr. Nguyenji. Before we take a lunch break, we'd like to know whether, Mr. Nguyenji, you are able to continue in the afternoon session and for how many hours? The accused, I'm getting weak, Mr. President, but I'll try my best. 
um, and I would be happy to answer all the questions today. But I request that the question be asked uh, in short forms. If the questions sound was interrupted, Mr. Pre the President, thank you. Then, uh, so you are confirming that you can continue in the afternoon session. Uh, councils, just go ahead. Um, I would like to consult my clients and also the medical um, expert, the doctor who will examine my client during the interval, and uh, maybe we can decide at the beginning of the next session on the basis of the information we get from the doctor as well whether he can continue answering questions. The president. Before the break, the chamber likes to inform the doctors who are on standby at this court to conduct medical assessments to all accused, particularly the accused Nguyen Chia and report back to the chamber his health status by 1.30. And it is now time for us to take the lunch break. The chamber is now adjourned for lunch and will be back at 1.30 this afternoon. Detention personnel are instructed to bring the accused back to the holding cells downstairs and return them to the courtroom by 1.30. The court is now adjourned. <laughs>